Well, we're here at the mushroom farm, but there's no service and I don't know where they are. So we're gonna find the owners and then we're gonna get tons of mushroom supplies. Check it out. That's the laboratory. Um, I can kind of show you, you know, that's Wendy's part. Now, I should explain to you what this historically is because it's obviously an old building. As a matter of fact, it's been refit a few times. You can see the door used to be over on the other side. Oh, you know, they don't make them like this anymore. You could keep these old ones running forever. I mean, that's how we got into growing mushrooms, actually, is we were wild mushroom hunters. Yeah. Untie them. They, when they pick them up off the field, they, they, the machine picks it up like a chunk at a time and then spreads it out so you can pull these off fold them in half and stuff them in there for for chopping straw. And then this thing's got a rotating drum with three inch uh, blades on it. It spins really fast and just shreds it really fine. You can see if I if I tried to stuff this stuff in a basket, it doesn't want to pack tightly uh, because it's all, it's very hard to mix with the uh, grain. Okay, so so I, I shred it real mm -hmm. fine like this. And then I can, uh, I cook it in the barrels there's a there's a burner under each barrel, really? um, and I cook it. Yeah, you can see. It's no big deal. Yeah, I cook it. The, the barrel it's upside down right now, but each barrel's got a burner under it. So I I fill these up with water, and then of course I bring the water up to a boil, and then I dunk the uh, basket of straw in there for around an hour, and then this actually is. Know, block and tackle an overhead hoist so of course those uh baskets when they're wet weigh about 250 pounds and they're boiling hot so you can't handle them so that's why i've got the overhead hoist wow you, most guys would just buy a winch i like this this is old uh ship equipment uh block and tackle it gives you leverage for lifting a heavy load but that's you know thousands of years old <laughs> yeah you know, the greeks were using those uh-huh but, That's amazing. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I I happen to like old equipment. I, I used to be an engineer, uh, professionally speaking. Oh, so that makes sense. I'm familiar <laughs> with the necessities of leverage and such. So but anyway, I'm... that lets me hold, pick out a, um, a hot basket of straw, and I've got it on a roller so that I can scoot it over. And I just put a little card up here with a drip tray, and I can drop the basket right on there once most of the free water's run out of it and oh. then uh, the next room over is my first sterile room which will turn on the lights in there and I'll show you in there if you're interested mm -hmm. just stop me if you oh yeah I'm interested <laughs> okay do I have to size well, this, we call this our control room because it's got you know also our stored equipment and stuff in it so this is where we put our boxes that's uh, grain spawn so all that is, it's, it looks like, you know, mycelia, it doesn't even look like grain, but if you, if you start to break it up, you'll see that's all rye grain with mycelia run through it. Oh. Okay. And then, uh, what I'll do is, uh, I cook that, I bring that cooked straw in here. There's my little cart and there's my drip tray. I mean, nothing real fancy there. Um, and I dump about half of one of those baskets into this inoculation chute, okay? And all this is is plywood, two by fours, and plastic liner. And uh, I just blow this fan right across the top of it. I can get that from boiling. Because it's wet, I can put it in here, fluff it, mm -hmm. and get it from boiling down to room temperature in like five minutes. Mm -hmm. By cooling it rapidly, it reduces the chances of contaminating it. And so once it's cool, I can put the rye grain spawn, which is my starter culture, mm -hmm. sprinkle it all through the, the straw, mix it by hand. And then at this end, this funnel, I actually attach um, tubing, you know, and the tubing just comes in rolls <laughs> just like this, you know, which that's just a, uh, I get it in 50 pound rolls. There's another one back there under the spawn. Um, and, uh, I just tie a knot at the end of it. 
Wow. You know, I tie a knot at the end, I strap the other end open around this funnel, I mix this, the, uh, the straw with the grain and just stuff it in. I don't have the lights on in here right now, but you can come on through here. I don't have a light switch for this room in the back. It's uh, oh, the front wow. of the barn. But, well, those are the little ones. Those are the, the, the half column size. The ones at the back here are the full size wow. ones. That's what I, I do for my operation. Yeah. These two are yours, the half columns. Um, these ones are part of my production, and then all the rest of these are going to a producer down in Columbus. Wow. He does not like handling these big, heavy ones. He likes the half-sized ones, so... So I do a big batch of 28 half-sized ones for him. Are and these all oyster mushrooms? This is all oyster mushrooms. Yeah, the, the mm. shiitakes and lion's manes are in a, a, the other barn. Awesome. I keep that all separate. So, yeah, I know you can't see in here super good because I don't have the lights on, but... But it's a good atmosphere. Yeah. So well, should... I'd like to keep it around. The, ideally, yeah, we'll walk around to that see I actually used to just separate this with the strip door but I actually seal it with plastic now and the reason is um, on a windy day I, I have positive pressure in here it's got mm -hmm. its own feet of air which mm -hmm. I draw like 30 feet above the ground to avoid drawing in contaminants but I also run it through a HEPA filter so this this actually has basically perfectly sterile air coming out of it oh. And that's what keeps it clean so I don't grow mold in here. I only grow mycelia. Mm. Now, that works with a positive pressure environment because the rest of the rooms are kept a little bit negative pressure because they have exhaust fans on them instead of intake fans. Okay. Um, and that'll work on a still day. But on a really windy day, the wind blowing air into the front rooms would actually overcome the the positive pressure and I would get contaminants from my fruiting rooms into here. So what I do is I just seal it with plastic now to eliminate that problem. That's it takes amazing. just a minute to put the plastic up and tear it down, but, but we'll just walk around the front uh, to see the fruiting rooms. Yeah, it is cool. And uh, you just come up with creative solutions whenever you run into problems. And that's what I always tell guys that are going on growing is you can look at everything I do and think you got it all figured out but the truth is things are going to come up and you're going to have to you're going to have to adjust yeah that is just life take a look in here this room I just emptied. So the way I control bugs organically is I actually will completely empty one of my two fruiting rooms and uh, you know kill off all the bugs by spraying them in walls with hot water until there's no bugs in here, and then I'll start putting the columns in here. Um, the other room is just about full, is why I just emptied this room. So these are this is where the other Wow. Yeah, you can see they just, uh, they sense <laughs> where the fresh air is and they just start growing out into the open air wherever I punch a hole in the bag, once it's mature enough. I just moved a bunch of columns wow. that are ready to wow. pin in here, so I got a lot of stuff that hasn't started producing babies yet, but there's a little bit of stuff for it fruiting right now. It's so cute in the middle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everybody wants you to pick the baby ones. Uh, like I can't make any money doing that. They don't weigh anything. <laughs> but yeah, they are neat how they form. And really, the colors are the prettiest. I think when they're babies. I foresee a market for micro My mushrooms. micro mushrooms. <laughs> I'm sure there is, but they'd have to cost a bundle to be worthwhile. That's the thing. I really hate to. I mean, I think part of what we do is try to keep this stuff very affordable. Yeah.
<laughs> so funny, it looks like a little, uh, rubber <laughs> animal. Yeah, it looks like one of those funny rubber balls or something. Uh -huh. I really like this strain. This is a a blue strain, but it's what I call my, my baby blue or summertime blue mm. because it'll keep fruiting in the in the summertime when it's really hot out and all the outside rows on down there are my big blue that everybody loves so much but unfortunately you can see there's no mushrooms on them and that's because they really don't produce in the heat oh really uh, even with the air conditioning they just don't want to they don't want to kick out until they can get for a sustained period under 65 degrees which is hard to attain with an air conditioner in a big room like this you know, with the necessity to draw some fresh air to, to feed the mushrooms. So, I always tell people, they're like, ah, oh, you just shut off the fans and it stays nice and moist and cool in here. It's like, nah, you can't shut them off entirely, certainly not all day, because um, as much air as it would take to burn this straw, which would be a lot of air, is how much air eventually has to be fed to the mycelia in order to metabolize that straw. So if you think about it, there's quite a bit of air, you know, because I'll fill this room entirely within a month. Um, so I need to get enough fresh air in here to basically burn all this amount of straw within a month or within a few weeks, really. So, you know, it does take a fair amount of fresh air to keep the mushrooms real healthy. Wow. Oh, I, um, now I can, I can show you. Um, this is, once again, we're, we're very organic thinking. So if I have any bug troubles and you can barely see it, but there's little tunnels around here. Oh. So if, if a bug lays eggs there, I just, uh, I watch it very closely. And wherever I see that, I just seal it. And then, you know, theoretically, a lot of times that blocks the air sufficiently mm -hmm. that they just die, the, mm -hmm. the larvae. But if they don't just die, they've got, yeah, you get a few. <laughs> They're usually fungus gnats. Um, there's fungus gnats and there's fungus beetles. There, there's a lot of, um, of insects that are evolved that they eat mushrooms. You know, and of course, being in a mushroom growing area in the woods here, they're right outside our doors. So a few of them inevitably will get in. Now I have screens on my uh, exhaust fans there, but a few of them will, will sneak around or come in through the door when we come and go. So there, that is a ongoing struggle. Right. But you control them and you watch and if they get going a little, you just tape and you just make sure that they're not breeding and, and uh, getting the numbers up badly. A few are not a problem. But, you know, I've, I've seen facilities where they're just everywhere and way too many yeah. bugs and they do a lot of damage. So you do have to control it. And we don't use any chemicals, so you, it's true. really a matter of just looking very closely. You develop a good eye to, to spot them. I know you probably couldn't hardly see anything was going on there, yeah. but, but if you do this for 20 years, you would know. Right. <laughs> it's like, oh, there's trouble. <laughs> and how many times can you grow from one Usually, um, it depends on the strain. Usually the, the browns, uh, I don't know, are there any browns coming out right now? I didn't really see any along there. It's almost all those baby blues. Now you can tell why I call my, my uh, summertime blues. Yeah, there's really no browns out right now, but the, um, the browns, the brown columns, you can tell because they're a little more lightly run, but they, they tend to just fruit too flushes and then I'm done with them. Oh. Sometimes in, in summertime I can get a good third flush out of them. These guys mm -hmm. I can often get five wow. good flushes so they'll they'll just keep producing more clusters if I just take care of them and keep the bugs away. Okay. You know or keep the bugs from getting to all the holes at least. <laughs> As you can see I go through here periodically and, and tape off any that do get uh, some bugs going. And it's just a matter of staying on top of it. What it's, about lion's mane? Because we lion's manes are we do in the other facility. We harvested the ones from the group, okay. the first flush, and then do we just leave it 
and does it grow yeah, again? Yeah, they'll grow. Usually they do three flushes. Okay. And the, the first flush often they're real big. Yeah. And the second flush they'll be about this big. And the third flush they'll be about this big. They get smaller with each flush. Do we have to water it again? No. No, it should have enough retained moisture in it. Oh. It should fruit in a couple weeks. Wow. Huh. Yeah, you just got to be patient. Excited. They awesome. need time to, to re rebuild their strength, re rebuild their reserves. Mm. They got to eat some of that sawdust for you. They're really fascinating organisms in that yeah, regard. They are. Okay. Hey, well, how much do you know about chemistry? Um, ce cellulose. Well, you think about how how we metabolize food. We a lot a lot of people refer to carbohydrates, simple mm -hmm. carbohydrates, as empty calories. Right. But the truth is, those empty calories is, are a big part of how we fuel all of our important metabolic processes like building um, mm -hmm. building proteins or fats or whatever we do need the raw materials but the energy comes from those those uh, simple carbs right. mushrooms are very much the same they can't fix atmospheric nitrogen but they have a lot of protein in them which is nitrogen compound so they take straw which is almost all fiber and the fiber is mostly cellulose, cellulose in combination with lignin. Uh, cellulose is just sugar linked with a single bond in an endless chain. So it, it's literally just glucose linked one on top of another basically yeah. forever. Um, so metabolically speaking, they're very much like us. We just don't have the enzyme to break the cellulose. For us, it's it's indigestible fiber, non-digestible fiber. Okay. For them, it's sugar. You know, that's oh, their main yeah. fuel for, for um, driving their metabolic uh, processes. So, you know, that's the great thing about them is they use what we can't. Yeah. <laughs> Which is cool. Awesome. It makes it into good food too. <laughs> I think it's good food. <laughs> I've always been fond of them. Yeah, we have some killer recipes with oh, you. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> we, we, ate the, we ate the lion's man. It was so good. Oh, good, oh good. man. Yeah, it was out of control. I can't wait for them to come out again. A lot of people don't know what to do with that mushroom, and they're, they just they try it, and they're like, I couldn't figure it out. They, it's they're um, kind of mushy bitter. and weird. Yeah, they're kind of They got a little bitterness to them, and a lot of people have a real strong uh, bitter yeah. sensitivity. It, the texture is kind of... Chewy. Kind of hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's hard to chew. Yeah, but if you if you fry it in a batter, it's so good. Yeah, it just makes it. Yeah, so I, I like to almost like pan sear them. I, I make sure just about all the water's out of them, fairly dried, and then I I put a good browning on them and I pepper them well and use them as an accent. Just mm. a couple of slices here and there. I don't tend to like go straight at that mushroom. Mm. It's just sort of an accent piece. These I could eat them all day long like yeah. popcorn oh i mean these these are just wonderfully edible <laughs> yeah. so oh. but each one sort of has its own speciality in terms of how they uh how you use them culinarily certainly this down here the other thing i tape off i should have mentioned is uh this is trichoderma mold so oh. If I do get a little bit of bad air into the room there, it will colonize with the mold. It doesn't actually harm the mycelia. It's actually more akin to what you would see uh, in the wild, is a colony of one thing running up against a colony of another. And it's interesting actually, because you see how you've got the green of the trichoderma mold, and you've got the white of the mushroom mycelia. In between, you've got a real wet, juicy yeah. layer. They're doing, uh, they're battling. The the, um, the mycelia actually produces antifungal and antibacterial compounds, which is actually why we actually get most of our uh, antibiotics from fungi. Penicillium, of course, is a is a fungus, um, but there's a whole series of them that produce different chemicals, and the reason is. They don't, they're not like us where we have a fairly impermeable skin right. to protect us and keep, you know, bacteria out and a fancy immune system to kill things off that do get in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's all out there. 
so they they do it by basically just pure chemical warfare against uh, their competitors that grow right up against them so that's what that juice is and yeah that's that's where you would want to do uh, chemical testing to find new antibiotics and antifungal uh, compounds because you know it's it's quite a it's quite a brew <laughs> they're they're quite uh, resilient organisms it's funny because in the wild like one mushroom will parasitize another and they'll like uh, they'll do things like they'll uh, cause the fruit body to abort and not form any gills so it can't reproduce. They do oh, really, wow. really mean things to each other. <laughs> to, yeah, the, the competitive world of wild fungi is, is really actually much more fascinating than anything I do here. <laughs> wow. Have you ever tried growing enoki mushrooms? I, we have grown them. As a matter of fact, they do grow wild in this area. Really? Yeah, they do. They don't what? look anything like what you get in the store, though. What do they look like? They uh, they look like a relatively ordinary... Actually, they look a lot like this, but the caps tend to be about two or three inches. Big caps. What? I'm not kidding you, okay? They're, they're stick tiny, stick with me. Stick with me. <laughs> you got to believe me on this, okay? I could get these to grow like the store Anokis. Okay, but I'd have to do it in the right conditions. Wow. The the trick, in, let me finish with the wild mushroom enoki. It's what we call winter mushroom around here. It tends to grow on on elms, dead elms, um, in low areas, and we do have clusters down along Killbuck. I see them periodically, um, but um, and they grow like in the middle of winter, real cold weather, very unusual. Um, the way they get them perfectly white and with the tiny caps and really long stems, they actually do them in bottle culture. Okay, not these great big oh, columns, okay. but I've in in little in jars. Yeah. Okay, Broken. but and and ordinarily that's not a big difference from this, except for they just put a little like a filter patch on top, uh, let it colonize all through the sawdust or. A lot of times they do that on a real strong uh, grain mix because it likes a lot of nutrition. Um, but that's neither here nor there. It just allows it to be a little more productive. Um, when it starts to fruit at the top of the colony, which is where the freshest air is, it senses the fresh air, remember, um, they take that cap off and then they, they take a piece of paper and they, they make a funnel out of the piece of paper and stick it down in the top of the jar. Now, why would they do that? Can't imagine, right? No. Okay. What? Okay, well, think what the paper would do. First of all, it would block the light somewhat, which is not a real problem, but probably helps to keep them white so they don't develop the, the uh, pigments, because it is actually a fairly dark mushroom in the wild, too. It's not white. Um, but the other thing it does is the mushrooms are using up oxygen, which is O2, and they're releasing carbon dioxide. Those are the main gas exchange, okay? Um, carbon dioxide is actually heavier than air because it's a, it's a heavier molecule. CO2 is obviously going to be heavier than O2, and I think it's even heavier than N2, which is the bulk of our air. Um, so what happens is, if you leave it in really still air, that, that funnel of paper pools, fills up with carbon dioxide. And the mushroom won't open its cap up. It won't put energy into opening its cap and developing the gills until it, it thinks it's out in the open. Because what... The way mushrooms form in the wild, and this comes from being a wild mushroom hunter before I grew, oh. is they normally actually don't form on the surface like this. As a matter of fact, you'll see that the baby mushrooms actually form inside under the plastic and then push out through the opening. Okay? Um, and in the wild that manifests even more so because uh, you have direct exposure to sun and, and, and dry conditions and so forth. They usually form under the bark where the moisture is retained better, not out on the surface of the bark because the, the mycelia can't really live out there because of the you know, hot, dry cycling. Um, the mushroom actually has to 
push through the bark before it opens its cap. Mm. And it can tell if it's, you know, grown out into a void or is still under the bark based on how fresh the air is. Mm -hmm. So it'll keep growing stem and some of them grow them like a ball until they explode the bark and some of them grow real long snaky stems trying to find a crack to get out of. Enoki's finds the crack by growing a long snaky stem and then when it gets to the fresh air it will open up its cap but they, they pick it before it opens its cap to make that special form of mushroom. Isn't oh. that cool? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that is so... <laughs> so you had no idea, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's a lot of tricks. Well, why do they do that, though? Why they, they do just... that because enoki is actually a fairly flavorless mushroom. It doesn't have a strong right. flavor. It's mostly grown for its texture. It's right. got that unique sort of crunch, and that's mostly in the stem. The oh. stem is what is the marketable product with enoki. Oh Really? So they grow that for that reason. <laughs> it's that really cool. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, want, I, want, I want to see the wild... The wild enoki. You have to come in uh, yeah. late, late fall or winter yeah. when they're actually growing. What is that? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's not exciting. It's just like any clustered mushroom growing on the side of a tree. But it's The cap is really big. Like yeah, it gets fairly large. I mean, they're not a big, big mushroom. I mean, some oyster mushrooms will have caps oh like God. this out in the wild. Wow. Um, what? But uh, so, so actually, like a two or three inch diameter cap is is a fairly modest mushroom. I can't imagine that. That's enough keeping like that. Yeah, I know. It's funny. And uh, but they do. I mean, if you look underneath, you can see they have very individual stems. And they are kind of long, skinny stems. I mean, they are recognizable in a few characteristics, even in the wild. Wow. But they uh, they are very, very different than than what's uh, marketed. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> what about like uh, the white? There, there's some mushrooms called seafood. Seafood. Well, that that's kind of a generic name. Um, Maybe lobster mushroom is, is uh, one of them. It, was like really long, it looks like a nookie, white. but it's fat. Yeah, it's oh, that's going to be a king oyster or, or a trumpet royale is another name for that. It's it's smaller actually an oyster. That. It's smaller than the two. But bigger than oh, the okay. Maybe this it's just thick? like a noki, but maybe triple as fat. But, oh, okay. Um, I don't know could, the other name. Um, or, or, this, um, was, this was set on the labels. We ate it a couple times. It wasn't that bad. It wasn't whatever. It was fine. Was it? Um, it could white. be a number of different things. Yeah. It could be one of the one of the we call those um, beach mushrooms. Uh, oh yeah, they they have beach mushrooms. Okay, they have that one too. The brown and the white. Because that's a little bigger, but they don't grow it up as long. They um, do them in shorter uh -huh. clusters, but that's also bottle culture. Um, you grow that too, I don't. I don't. Right now, we're just doing several oyster varieties, shiitake and lion's mane. Is that and the best sellers? Or? Those are just really good, reliable sellers. It's oh. what the it's what the restaurants are demanding a lot of, uh, and it's about all we can manage. Because we don't have employees. It's just what my wife lion? and I. Where do they uh, cook lion's mane? What's that? Where? What, oh, like where do they cook mane? lion's mane? Yes. Uh, I know I San, uh, Sasamatsu uh, uses them some. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, one of the classic so things that, um, have you ever heard of uh, monkey's head soup? Okay, it's, it's, it's a Chinese dish, actually. It's, um, but it, um, it's, it's one of the classic ways that they prepare lion's mane. It's not, they call lion's mane, what we call lion's mane, Europeans call hedgehog mushroom, Chinese call uh, monkey's head mushroom. Ah. So monkey's Korean head soup. Deer butt. Deer butt? Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I will use that. I love it. So That's actually Korea. a better name right? than yeah. the way the like fur it. is. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, but but doing them in soup is, is, and I think that's what Sasamatsu is doing, is they're doing like a monkey's head soup. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's what they do. Um, there's other ones that'll do like a grill seared uh, mm -hmm. slabs as just like a topper. And 
I, I think, think um, we have the best recipe. I want to find like a soup though. The, yeah. it's like. the thing that everybody's buying them for right now is actually the mock um, crab cake, which oh. is a vegetarian crab cake because oh. it's strandy yeah. and it's real sweet oh, and rich like work. crab. Yeah. And they just pull it apart and then they use it like oh, they would inside for... the sushi would be good. Yeah, where they use oh, crab like usually. Yeah. Well, that might be an option. Yeah. Mm. It would be good. If you cut it into like fish sticks and fry on <laughs> like fat french fries. Oh, oh that would be good. <laughs> I can play with it, you know, figure wow. it out. But that's, that's one that's like not been used a lot in the United States, so there's very right. few recipes that are yeah, like right. American recipes right. that you got to go elsewhere yeah, in the never world to get it. good recipes. You know, but it is yeah. one that's that's been long in cultivation elsewhere in the world. Yeah, they're popular in Korea. I mean, yeah. There's Do you dry them here? Drying was not considered um, processing, and oh, all of a sudden, weird. like last year, they they decided, eh, drying's processing, so you can't do it anymore. Wow. Um, but they'll probably change their mind again, which is well. I mean, you can dry every other crop. Right. Without it being processing, why can't I dry a damn mushroom? Right. I'm sorry, it kind what? of ticks me off, honestly. Because that's, that's a big market. It's they don't know what they're doing. I think in regulating mushrooms right. in the United States, it's funny because they regulate them really tightly, as if they're a major um, foodborne uh, illness uh, vector. Uh -huh. There's never been a case of mushroom, uh, um, you know, contamination causing illness in, in people in the United States. Incredibly. I, I can hardly believe that's true, but but there's been several researchers that have looked into it. They're not, they actually produce antibiotics. Right. They right. kill. They're, they're good for you. They, they, <laughs> they kill uh, bacteria. You know, they're not a good place for bacteria to grow. You can get a mushroom to rot, but you really have to try. They're much more apt to just dry out if you leave them too long in the fridge. That's true. Yeah. But if you leave them wet long enough and they totally die, they will decay eventually. Can you eat raw oyster mushrooms? Yeah, you can eat raw and oyster mushrooms. I've never tried it. Always falling apart. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is very different from Colony. Now, this is what's called block culture. That was column culture. Yeah, I've seen videos of this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is more familiar because this is how. Almost everybody commercially produces uh, shiitake. Oh, this is all shiitake? Not quite all shiitake. There's a few lion's manes on the last row. We just do a small number of, of lion's manes, but almost all of this is shiitake. The lion's manes only have to colonize for a couple weeks till we can fruit them. The shiitakes have to colonize for like three, four months. So those are the ones we just did yesterday. You can see, if you look really close, a little bit of fuzz coming out from the grain, the starter culture. So that's just one day growth, which is almost nothing. Mm -hmm. But just start to see a little white dot there around each grain. Yeah, you can see there, we'll get a few volunteers that will start when they're fully mature. The process of maturing basically goes from the brown of just wet sawdust with some rye grain in it, to when it's when it's we call this whited out when the mycelia has spread throughout the sawdust then there's a another stage actually i don't see any right at that stage now here here's some that are doing it this is called popcorning so as the colony gets stronger and stronger the surface starts to pucker it starts to look like popcorn kind of and then the final stage is actually browning where it forms actually a brown sort of artificial skin on the outside of the colony wherever it receives good light which is why we are actually we used to have all fluorescents we're switching over to leds because it gives them real good light huh. um but anyway uh once they're fully browned like this nice and dark brown then we're ready to fruit them and uh, unfortunately, we can't just punch holes in these bags to fruit them. Um, we actually have to um, strip the bag off because they fruit all over where that artificial skin is, where they form that brown uh, outer layer. 
Um, that's how they orient themselves to the outside world. Different, different mushrooms do that differently. You gotta keep in mind, they don't have eyes and they don't have senses like us. So they're basically just fuzzy fungus growing inside a mass of fiber of some sort, often just a big dead log. Mm -hmm. So they need to have some way of knowing where the outside of the colony is so they know where to form their fruiting bodies for reproduction. So some of them do it by sensing the fresh air and some do it by sensing where there's sunlight exposure. Oh. Others actually do it by sensing where there's uh, contamination, bacteria. Mm. They, they, uh, and those are like a lot of the ground growing mushrooms. So they can sense where the edge of the colony is based on where the contaminants are and then they grow up through that. That's mm. like ones that they put casing layer on like a button mushroom and wine capstropharia. Oh. Um, so it's different for different mushrooms. But these, this is a good sample because we have one that's an air sensor and this one's a light sensor. So once they're brown, they're ready to fruit. Um, I didn't really give you the background here. Um, I mix basically a whole truckload of sawdust on the concrete pad out there along with a bushel of rye grain that I've soaked overnight. And I mix it real thoroughly. Uh, I wet it down to its basically its carrying capacity of water, as much water as will soak into that uh, rye grain and, and sawdust. And then I put them in these bags. I just take a gallon scoop and scoop a gallon's worth of that mix into each of these bags, fold over the top, load them onto these carts here, the, the wood-ended ones down there, which fit the inside diameter of this, which is an autoclave or a big... Wow. Retort or pressure cooker. Yeah, it is big. It's a 20 foot or 42 inch diameter. Um, but we fill that thing uh, when we do a full size batch with uh, four four foot carts spread out down the length of it. And anyway, this is just uh, this is just like a household pressure cooker. I mean, it, this gigantic boiler here just produces 15 psi steam, just like you would on a stovetop pressure cooker. Have you ever used a pressure cooker? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's it's very similar to that. Very, very similar. Just gigantic. <laughs> yeah. So we load it in from the outside and then after it's cooked for four hours at 15 PSI, which is, I don't know, 255 Fahrenheit or so, um, then we let it cool down overnight and then we open the inside door with it all nice and sterile in here, unload them one cart at a time, 15 blocks lined up in front of the, the filters there. The filters are what's called a laminar flow bench, which um, when I turn on the blowers, will produce a nice steady flow of basically perfectly sterile air. They're 99.97 percent efficient at 0.3 microns, so they won't allow anything as big as a bacterial spore to go through them. Super special filters, really thick, like a foot thick. Um, but basically that provides you with sterile air, so you can open up each bag, put a little starter culture in it, mix it real good, and then, uh, well, there's actually two steps. After you mix it real thoroughly, you use this, which is my block press, it comes down on it and you just push down really hard on it and it pushes the sawdust together very tightly and then you use that sterile air grab a big bubble of air on top and then this actually seals it by melting a strip across the top so if you look at the bag each bag has its little bubble which is a sterile atmosphere and then a melted strip uh -huh. sealing it from the outside world. Beyond that, for the next three months, the only air it can get has to come through this patch. And the, oh. the patch is basically made from the same material that the filters are made from. It's called a microporous filter patch. Mm -hmm. And the pore size is so small that no spores can go through it. Nothing living can go through it, but it'll allow gas gases to exchange. Mm -hmm. So carbon dioxide can leave and oxygen can go in to keep it alive and healthy so you know but once it's fully colonized you don't need that anymore because it'll it'll fight for its own space 
it won't let other stuff contaminate it if it can help it okay so these are ready to fruit i can show you how we fruit them then in the other room Yeah, it doesn't have any in here. Uh, right now, yeah, I know it's a little street heat. Oh, Kentucky. Yeah, the ones, yeah, these ones have already basically fruited. This is what we call the trickle flush, which is after the primary fruiting, they'll trickle out a few more mushrooms. <laughs> and nowadays in the summertime, yeah, the primary fruiting is over here. You can see the, the first flush is like really. Wow. Really impressive, wow. but then the trickle flush, you get another, yeah. you know, 20% more or so. And then in the summertime, there, there's so many contaminants in the air that we basically just do those two flushes and get them out of here before they, they become a problem. So basically, they're just quickly cycling through this end of the room. In the wintertime, when the air is cleaner, I'll soak them and I'll move them on the shelves further back. Uh, to get some more mushrooms off of them, but it's more more efficient to just, we call it one and done. It's really two flushes and done. And sawdust is relatively cheap, and so is grain. Mm -hmm. And it makes an excellent garden supplement, so I just put them on a, in a shredder out back, and I shred them right onto my gardens for oh, that one's keeping huge. my soil nice and fluffy. Ah, uh, yeah, I should point out something about those. They have one peculiar characteristic, these these big ones here. Mm -hmm. I can tell that during the cold shock, those pinned in the bags because this flat area with no surface decoration without the, the fluffy little tufts uh -huh. on the saw, those are formed because they were pressed against the inside surface of the plastic uh -huh. before we strip the plastic off. So I'll get a few flat tops like that if they volunteer a little too quickly. That one's big. What? You see a big one? Oh, that one's upside down, yeah. The truth is, when we when we strip the plastic, we actually invert the block. So what you're seeing as the top of the block now was the bottom of the block before we took the plastic off. So that's why you got an upside down mushroom there, as if one before you took the plastic off. It was ahead of the game. <laughs> oh, lion's veins. Yep, lion's veins. Same size block, same plastic and everything, but the difference is they sense fresh air. So all I gotta do is oh, punch yeah. holes in them and they find their way out. Oh, yeah. And the nice <laughs> thing about that is I don't have to soak them or anything. They retain their own moisture wow. and they have enough to produce three batches without having to do anything to them. These are first batch. Those smaller ones there are, are probably second flush, and then the third flush ones. Yeah. Well, those back there are second flush for sure because they're about two or three inches. These ones that are three or four inches are first flush. Third flush are typically only an inch or two. Like these might be third flush back here. Oh, after a while, they turn yellow. Is that the time? To uh, if you start getting a little yellowing on the top, that's definitely, you want to harvest them then. Uh, it's basically, it's starting to dry a little on the very top surface. Um, basically, you hire, harvest them at whatever age people want to buy them at. I mean, it's not, there's not a specific ripeness. The longer you keep them on, the tougher they'll be and a little bit more prone to be uh, bitter. Uh, although I, I think that travels seasonally more than with maturity. Hmm. Um, that, that bitterness is something that's a little hard to peg down what exactly triggers that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once they're fully colonized, they will, they'll eat the filters. You know, they'll just eat their way because they shouldn't be able to do that, right? Well... They can if they can actually decompose the material the filter's made out of. Wow. You know, because before that filter wouldn't have allowed even a spore to pass, let alone a whole colony to march through. Wow. You know, uh, but yeah, give them a little time. They'll eat the box that you buy them in or the paper bag that you buy them in. Interesting. They, 
They're not normal <laughs> organisms. <laughs> they're, they're very unusual. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and when you buy them at market, I mean, they're alive. You can get a good culture off of a mushroom from market. That's how we used to get our cultures. Now we know a lot of people with other laboratories, and we kind of trade cultures back and forth for for good mushrooms. We're mm. all friendly with each other. That's nice. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a good group. They uh, a, lot of, a lot of really fun people who like to experiment and try things. Wow. Well, I got a good education. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thank you got you. an education. Um, that's what I know. I've been doing this for long enough. That... Do you have any books that you would recommend to a beginner? Um, depends. Are you looking? There's there's three sets of books. There's cultivation uh, books, uh, in which case like uh, Peter Oy does a really good one. Paul Stamets got some good uh, cultivation books. Uh, those are the two main ones I, I recommend for beginning cultivators. Mm -hmm. um, the um, there's others though. I mean there's there's like pamphlets that some of the universities have put out for specific mushrooms, like if you want to do log shiitake, which by the way I should show you the shiitake logs, because we do actually have log shiitake oh, yeah, on they, actual oak. They were actually, I saw they were selling log sure, sure. market. Yeah, a lot of times yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll do them as kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I give them to friends ones. and stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anyway, um, as far as like wild mushrooms, do you, do you do any wild mushroom hunting? Or are you interested? Well, in yeah, this sounds fun. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. awesome. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, and that's where you get to really good mushrooms too, because <laughs> that's I mean some of that stuff you just can't grow, like chanterelle. I'd love to like grow chanterelle. Turkey tail. Turkey tail. Turkey tails. I I consider that more like a tea mushroom and medicinal. Uh, it's very common around here. Really. Uh. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Uh, turkey tail is so expensive, I know. and it shouldn't be. I mean, it's it's relatively common and simple to grow. Um, I don't know why wow. it would be so expensive. What about like cordyceps? Cordyceps now, that's that's actually a parasitic. Uh, they does have funny um, fruiting bodies, real long and skinny, uh -huh. um, and that's how they grow in the wild too. But they're parasites, weirdly, of caterpillars. Yeah, they look it, like that. Yeah, yeah and, they, and they they they, um, they only uh, occur in like limited areas. Like uh, I know they're a big big crop in uh, Tibet. Um, oh. I don't know how broad the region is where they occur. It, to my knowledge, we don't have any native cordyceps here, but I could be wrong about that. What else do we Tr truffles is another one that a lot Chaba? of people will ask Chaba? about. What is it? Oh, chaga? Yeah. Chaga is not actually considered to be native to this area, but I do know a couple of people who have found them wow. here. They're, they're a very sparse periodic. They, I understand they, they uh, grow on uh, river birch in this area. Mm. Um, I've never found one. I've gotten a culture from friends who have found them. So. Oh. I do actually have a culture. I've thought about messing with that if I can ever find a little time. Mm. Um, but chagas, yeah, that's a neat mushroom. That's another one that's well known medicinal mushroom yeah. more than culinary. Right. Um, yeah, there's there's you know, there's so many mushrooms. Oh, you yeah, have no idea. I've eaten eighty mushrooms that, that grow here. Wow. So and that's just the ones that I've eaten. I and I'm very cautious. I don't eat stuff that I'm not certain of. Right. So, right. Dangerous. There's about 2,000 that grow in this oh. immediate area. Worldwide, wow. it's over 5,000 species that That's are known, you know, large, recognizable fruiting body mushrooms. There's lots of there's lots of fungi that grow weird fruiting bodies that could be called mushrooms, but they're so tiny as to be not what we would normally refer to as a mushroom because we think of mushrooms as something big we can slice up and fry, uh -huh. you know. But there's lots of teeny tiny mushrooms, like bird nest fungi, which wow. is really cool. They actually, <laughs> it forms a cup, okay, on the surface, just like a cup fungi or something that would then form spores. 
but the cup inside of it, when it opens up, has spore packets that are round and smooth like eggs. It looks like a, not just a bird's nest, but a bird's nest full of eggs. It's the damnedest thing. And they're really common. They grow in mulch uh, around ha houses all the time, and people just don't even notice this incredibly fascinating stuff. Wow. There's such cool stuff that grows around here. I'm obviously a fungus nerd, but are those ones edible or no? <laughs> no I, I don't know. I mean, oh, yeah. they're they're they they tend to be just about this big, you know. Okay. So it's like, well, it could be edible, could not, but it's so tiny that it's hardly would be worth it if it was. Wow. You know, there is a practicality. You know, when uh -huh. you get below a certain time size, we don't really think of it as food anymore. You know. Yeah with some notable exceptions like kombucha or you know the which is just a they don't even take that to the fruiting body it's just a colony but it's a, a filamentous fungi like mycelia for mushrooms mm. but they actually yeah. ferment a chunk of that mm. in a sugar water mix just like you were brewing alcohol but instead of using yeast which is another fungi but not a filamentous one it's an individual cell fungi um, but they, you get a different product. You don't end up with the alcoholic product. You end up with kombucha, you know, right. however you pronounce it. I don't know if I pronounce yeah, it right. I think that's that's right. kind of the hillbilly pronunciation. <laughs> wow. That's the funny thing. I know a lot of stuff about this and I've read it and studied it and everything, but I, I, I mispronounce a lot of stuff because I've learned everything from books. You know, <laughs> no there's just such a small it. community yeah. of people that are knowledgeable in this right. area. Of it. It's just why I'm filming you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if I count, but I know some things at least. I know oh, the I tip of the iceberg. I, I will tell you though, if you are interested in doing um, learning wild mushrooms, join the Ohio Mushroom Society. They're really cheap. It's like fifteen dollars a year to be a member, oh. and they not only do they do forays where you can go out for free with a group of people. But they have some of the best mushroom experts in Ohio. They go on those forays and they'll identify everything for you. And they often like have a fun get together afterwards and cook what? like dozens ah, and dozens of different mushrooms. Fun. It's an awesome way to spend your time if you got any spare time. Wow. We should, put a, we should find out and put a link in this video. Yeah, there you go. People watching him. <laughs> Yeah, they're they're good folks. Uh, we've had them down here and let them walk on our place just because we love them as an organization. Unfortunately, I never have any time to go on the walks elsewhere because oh. we're mm -hmm. working all the time. But you can bet I sure loved walking with them when they were out here. Well, thank you so much for giving us a tour. Yeah, yeah, I hope it's of some interest. <laughs> oh my God, I'm sure. <laughs> very interesting. Thank you. That's very kind of you to say. And I think a lot of people will also think so. Oh, these are uh, these are also grain spawn. The reason I set them out here instead of putting them in the cooler is anytime I get a discolored patch like that, I'm suspicious oh. that it has a uh, contaminant in it. Oh. So we'll just put that on the garden just to be cautious. The truth is if you let that sit for a long time, generally the mycelia will kill off the contaminant and you can use the grain um, for spawn, but I... For, for us, it's just a, a hindrance and a risk yeah. that we don't need to take. Yeah. And rye grain's very inexpensive anyway, so we just cycle it out to the garden and don't worry about it. They get set aside if we get any spots on them. Mm. We got tough standards. Yeah, yeah that's, that's good. good. <laughs> wow. This so, is... Oh, come on over here. I'll show you the logs quicker. And it is. But no traffic goes up there. So this is our little tributary creek. Oh, nice clear stream. Yeah, nice clear water stream. It really helps to keep it cool back here. Uh, I don't know, you know, probably don't want to get your feet wet. Uh, you can actually just walk through up here. But I'll caution you that there are some nettles. Nettles sting you. We also like eat insects. nettles. These are nettles for really the sharp teeth. These are not over on the other side. What did she say? 
I said we eat nettles, actually. Oh, nettles are delicious, and they're also, I've actually heard it argued that they are the most nutritious wild food you can eat. Oh, wow. Definitely one incredible. of them. Yeah, but this is where I keep my natural log shiitakes. Obviously, there's nothing fruiting right now because natural log shiitakes like it when it's cool outside. So I get a, a great big fruiting off of this whole row um, in the spring and in the fall. But uh, it is picturesque back here. Why do you suppose I have them here? Because of the humidity? Yeah, cool and humid. It's a micro environment. Yes. Um, the other thing is, awesome. to get good fruitings off of them, you got to soak them periodically. Oh, really? Throw them in the creek. <laughs> it's easy. It's efficient. You know, you got to think that way. You got to look at the resources that are there and be be efficient with them if you want to be light on the environment. Yeah. The the risk to doing this is having them along this creek when you have a real gully washer uh, flash flood. I had a line about a third as long as this on the other side, under where those trees are. There ain't no bank there anymore, and they all went downstream. <laughs> I lost that whole line. Mm. So that's that's the risk to doing this, but oh, man. I, you take the risk with the reward. You know? Does like one log produce as much as one block? or About, but it takes about three years to produce that much mushrooms really? and the blocks I get it you know yeah. well I let it colonize for three months on the blocks but I get all the mushrooms out of it in like three weeks my parents wow. had, had one of these log at one one time and they maybe came out like five or six oh, okay. <laughs> or something yep. cool. yeah you can do that um I grilled them you can grow anything on logs all these mushrooms that I grow naturally in the wild grow on logs Mm -hmm. So these are different techniques for imitating this. Right. But solid wood breaks down very slowly and it and it lets um, oxygen diffuse into it very slowly. So it's a it's a long process breaking down wood. But that's the niche that they are evolved to fill. You can see the mycelia there where the bark breaks off. It's all white inside oh. from the mycelia. It's all like that under the bark, but it, you know it can't exist out on the surface to speak of because because uh, it gets too dry you know mm. it needs that moisture protection interesting mm -hmm. so yeah. that's the natural way of doing it a little unsteady here because this creek keeps on washing into my bank but I haven't lost this line yet oh, so nice. I know <laughs> <laughs> I visited my dad the other day and he was rubbing his leg on nettles on what? purpose. Oh, man! What? He was saying that he was developing immunity to it. Oh, wow. Does it, does and it cause something? We were arguing about it. If it really... <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I mean, it is, an, it is an immune reaction. You know, it's, it's a... I'm here. A lot of them were misnamed because people don't call them uh, poplar trees, tulip poplars specifically, but it's actually the... Well, thanks again, and I got some great footage.